This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everybody. We'll, we will call this Tampa Bay Estuary Program Policy Board meeting for November 17th to order. First off, roll call, Maya. Commissioner Justice. Here. Commissioner Owen. Commissioner Bearden. Ms. Weaver for Commissioner Mariano. Here. Ms. Michalik for Council Member Montanari. Here. Council Member Hurtaw. Here. Council Member Beckman. Here. Ms. Vasquez for Director Boatwright. She is present online. Mr. Holton. Here. Mr. McGill. Here. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get to the next thing, I want to read you a note from uh, Commissioner Owen from Hillsborough County. He's unable to attend the meeting today due to a board scheduling conflict. He serves on the Transportation Planning Organization's Policy Board, and they've called a special meeting for voting members today. Um, and he asked for this to be read into the record, so we know he's not just skipping out today. No, we appreciate the Commissioner. Uh, item number one, changes to agenda. You have an uh, updated item number 10. Uh, do we need to vote to approve that? Into is there a motion to approve the change to the agenda? So moved. Second. Any questions? Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Show it passes unanimously. <clears throat> Item number two minutes from the August 18th. Are there additions, edits, or is there a motion to approve? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So on uh, number 13, so this was uh, uh, the August meeting, and we had that wonderful presentation from Mr. Piles about uh, existing issues and legal approaches to regulating the artificial turf. And uh, and the reason I ask about just a little clarification with this, uh, the notes uh, on, the, on the minutes, is our city is in the midst of dealing with this head on. And we had a meeting, a council meeting last night, and I mentioned that we had uh, given direction to the Tampa Bay Estuary Program Board to uh, to get some more research and information and so we've got that um, and board members expressed appreciation and um and encouraged staff to seek additional funding to conduct research evaluating the various trade-offs between native florida friendly so i just i'd like a little more clarity on how that's interpreted or what we might be able to expect going forward if i can report back yeah, so we'll have our developing our draft work plan that we'll bring to the February meeting. Okay. So if there's strong desire to have a research component focused on artificial turf, we can include that in our uh, fiscal year 2025. Okay. There's also opportunity to have a targeted call through the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund, which would open up at the beginning part of the calendar year list that as a research priority. Jessica is going to be talking about our identified research priorities for the upcoming 2024 t uh, solicitation. So that'd be another way we could catalyze research around those top clearings. That research for t what what'd you say that was? Oh. Uh, it's going to be for the 2024 Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund solicitation, which will probably open around January, and then we'll ask for proposals by Okay. All right. All good. Thanks for that clarification. A motion to approve the minutes. Second. We have a motion to second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Show it passes unanimously. Item number three, general citizens comments. Do we have any general citizen comments? Seeing none. Item number four, audit service plan overview and timeline. Ed, you want to introduce yeah. you? Julie Davis and Elise Leach from uh, Rivera Gardemar is here to provide a, a, an overview of our audit activities for fiscal year 2023. Um, as you know, we selected them to perform our audits over the next five fiscal years, and they're gonna, just going to give a run through of their activities and what to expect as they present their audit findings at the next February board meeting. With that, I'll turn it over to them. Hello. Julie Davis, I'm the shareholder of the Fair Court of Community. Today we're going to go over our audit service plan as we're going to be gearing up for the audit to begin in just a few short weeks. So in front of you is just a general, it's called a service plan. It goes over our required communications with you all, as well as a lot of the timeline and provide 
to bring him if you should be ready. So I'm going to walk through our presentation and beginning on page one. It's just a summary of our organizational chart, which is a summary of the team and how the audit process works. First and foremost, at the very top is the Tampa Bay Estuary Program and the board members here. Um, we report directly to you all. We work with the management to get through the audit process, but we are hired by the board and report to the board, and that's always first and foremost. Myself, I'm the account administrator, and what that means is that I'm responsible for actually signing the report, ensuring the audit quality standards, and things of that nature, making sure that we meet all the deadlines um, to be at your next board meeting. Below that, we have a couple other people in the office. We have um, Stephen Douglas, Sam Lazaro. They're also shareholders. Um, based on the type of funding that you all have, we're required to do a secondary or quality control review um, of the audit process, and those are the individuals that would be designated to do that process within our office. Um, below that is Elise Leach. Um, she's a supervisor in our office and is joining me today. So Elise's role on the engagement is really going to be in the day-to-day -day stuff, making sure everything gets done, making samples, working through the majority of the audit process, along with some staff auditors from our office. And really all of this is summarized on the next page on page two. So if you wanted to look back into whose role was what, this really just describes each person's role on the audit process. Moving on to page three. So this really goes over our responsibilities and your responsibilities during the audit process. Our responsibilities are under accordance with generally accepted auditing standards, government auditing standards, and the uniform guidance, which is basically the single audit piece. You know, as a government agency, as well as um, having the type of funding you all receive, there's a lot of different things that we have to make sure that um, we go through through the audit process, and this really just describes a lot of that. So our uh, responsibilities will be to provide an opinion on your financial statements, and that opinion is going to be reasonable assurance and not absolute. And so what that means is that we're going to be using risk-based audit approach, which is where a lot of those things come into play, communications with your team, what are the high-risk areas, what are things that you know may be important to the board or other stakeholders, um, and that we'll be also using a lot of sampling through the audit process as well. And with that, I'm going to really turn it over to the future to touch on some of the primary focus areas. Thanks, Julie. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Elise Leach, and I'm going to briefly go over essentially some of the main primary focus areas that we have for the audit this year. So for internal controls, um, what we usually do is review the internal control processes, and we perform testing usually for uh, cash disbursements and payroll tested controls to make sure that everything is working properly. Again, we don't do an internal control audit, but we do sample procedures that happen during the year um, and test that the controls that you have in place are working properly. For cash and investments, we confirm year in balances and also review the year in reconciliations that are performed for both cash and investments. For grant receivables and revenue, we utilize a grant roll forward and also confirm grant receivables and um, revenues for the year, and as well as review grant expenditures that are recorded. For accounts receivable and revenues, we select a sample of membership dues and any contributions that are received um, to see, and as well as test subsequent uh, receipts that are received after year end. For capital assets, we test additions and any disposals that happen during the year. For payables and accrued expenses, we review payables aging at year end, as well as perform an analysis over payroll accruals. For pension liabilities and disclosures, we help management record the pension journal entries at year end for the liability and the contributions based on the um, actuary reports at year end. And then for net position classifications, we reconcile the classifications and any restrictions for the purposes of the financial statements. With that, I'm going to pass it back to you later. Thank you, Elise. So that's a little bit of the detail audit process, what we're going to be focusing on. Um, so feel free to stop us if you have questions, comments, concerns, we'll be happy to incorporate those. You can also reach out to us during the audit process as well. So coming up this year, there's going to be some more new changes. I know in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of new changes, a lot of new accounting standards. Um, this year, it's called GASB 96, subscription-based IT arrangements. We're not anticipating a huge impact on the financial statements, but it, basically what the standard is, is um, if the organization has committed to a multi-year agreement with some subscription-based IT, think you know, Microsoft 365, um, any type of IT-related softwares, 
Um, if they're for multi-year, they're going to be reported as a payable because you haven't committed to it, and those are going to end up on the balance sheet, much like leases have in the last couple of years as well. Um, moving down the list is our tentative time plan. Um, we're going to be getting started. We started some preliminary planning processes though already, um, and really the bulk of our work is going to get started after the holiday coming up, and in December we'll be going through a lot of the detailed audit process. In January, once the FRS reports are issued, we'll be working with management and drafting the financial statements, working through that internal quality control review so that we can come to your February board meetings to deliver our process. And then finally, um, we're always required to report to you all whether we have any independence, conflicts of interest, or anything of that matter. We have no conflicts. We've reviewed that process and are pleased to report that we are independent of the estuary program. And then on page five, um, continuing professional education, all those standards I talked about at the beginning have a lot of continuing education requirements that go along those. Um, we're pleased to report that we meet and actually exceed those, um, those education requirements, and we do that every two years from our reporting process on top of our individual licensing for just our CPA licenses as well. And then included as well is at the very end is our peer review report, just some communications with you all. Um, much like you're getting started on the audit mm -hmm. process, we get audited as well. Um, we're pleased to report that our last audit was a clean opinion as well. We had no matters of comments, um, and actually, as we're going to be wrapping up your audit, we will be getting our audit at the same time this year. So um, you'll be seeing a new report from us as soon as that's available. We send it out to all of our governmental clients to make sure that you have the latest and greatest information on what you're relying upon from us. And so with that, I want to see if anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, anything I can answer for you today. Questions? Very good. Well, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you at the first of the year. Appreciate your time today. All right. Agenda item number five, quarterly financial report and uh, program-wide budget. Mr. Sherwood. Yeah, on page 10 of your packets, you'll see the overview of our year-ending fiscal year 2023 Q4 report. Uh, this will be the basis for the audit that you and Elise will be conducting over the course of the next several months. So just some highlights from uh, this uh, Final fiscal year 2023 report. Overall activity was a little bit lower than what we expected going into this year. Uh, so, in terms of total revenues, we're at a little over 2.1 million. Uh, we're expecting a little bit over 3 million, so about 70% of what we projected in terms of revenues. And this is just related to activity uh, and expenses that you know haven't been incurred in this fiscal year and will probably roll into the next fiscal year. Uh, so it's not like we're losing that revenue, it's just we didn't realize it uh, during the course of this fiscal year period. On the expense side, we're about 76% of what we anticipated in terms of over overall expenses, so about uh, 2.3 million, uh, and we we're anticipating about 3.1. And again, these are primarily due to project delays uh, and projects rolling into the next fiscal year. Um, mm -hmm. so experience those expenses and revenues uh, probably in the upcoming fiscal year 2024. And I've footnoted a couple items just to bring to your attention and, and kind of deviated uh, significantly from what we anticipated in the, the budgetary process. In terms of in-kind revenues, we did not collect any in-kind revenues. We use these as match towards our federal uh, work plan grant. Uh, again, that was primarily related to project delays. We would just expect to collect those in-kind revenues in fiscal year 2024 as those project expenses are documented by partners and submitted to us. Um, other than that, uh, we're slightly over in terms of communication services. Uh, this actually relates to some of the IT services subscriptions of some uh, we had to purchase for, for staff. So this will be actually recognized. Some of these expenses will be recognized in this year's audit as well. Uh, printing expenses I talked about uh, in prior reports, we incurred a little bit more printing expense for a state of the Bay report at the beginning of the fiscal year. And then with completion with, of the economic valuation at the tail end, we went a little bit over in what we anticipated in terms of printing expenses for fiscal year 2023. Uh, and the same could be said for other expenses. We actually uh, decided to do a sponsorship towards the tail end of the year, and we had a little bit higher in terms of legal ad costs for advertising our initial budget for fiscal year 2024 um, than we originally budgeted. So slight, slightly over in terms of a couple thousand for each of those light items, but for the majority, you can see that we're, we're fairly well below uh, what we anticipate in the budget. Um, these are, again, just ex expenses that we incurred in this, and recognized in this fiscal year. Uh, and, um, as we uh, go forward and, and 
we've already passed the initial budget for next fiscal year and as we make adjustments to the pace of projects being completed we might come back and make any adjustments to the fiscal year 2024 budget uh, um, at mid-year in may of, of meeting again it's just reflecting sort of the pace of projects being completed throughout the course of uh, our, our current fiscal year. So I'll, I'll stop there, see if there's any uh, particular questions. Again, this is what the, is gonna be the basis for our audit uh, um, mm -hmm. and that Julie will be in charge of over the next couple of months. Questions? Discussion? Motion to accept? It's not approved. We have motion? Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Show passes unanimously. Item number six, Mr. Sherwin. Moving on to page 11 of your packet. So uh, each November we also try to bring uh, to the board what we have identified as our legislative priorities. And these are uh, talking points that when we visit with both our state and federal delegation on some of the key initiatives that we're trying to direct, uh, increase awareness as well as support for. Uh, to initiate throughout the watershed. Um, a lot of the, what is identified here was pretty common to what we have had over the past several years in our legislative priorities, but I wanted to point out a couple of different uh, items that um, are, are adding to the list of our talking points for, for this coming uh, legislative session. So on the state side, uh, we know that um, there's keen support of additional uh, um, uh, funding towards the expansion of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Uh, we have a number of different uh, habitat restoration and preservation targets identified in Tampa Bay as well. So we want to continue to educate our legislators on the need to protect some of the key habitats, especially along our river corridors that might link up to the Florida Wildlife cor Corridor where a lot of those funded funding has been directed already. Uh, continue to raise awareness about the need for additional upgrades as well as uh, improvements are centered around our stormwater and wastewater uh, infrastructure throughout the region. So any dedicated support and cost sharing that can be garnered for our municipal governments around that topical area is, is always of keen interest for us. Um, the statewide stormwater rule uh, was actually passed last year, but there's still a need for implementation language. Uh, to be enacted by the legislature. So we want to continue to encourage that to be pursued at the state level. We think that's another tool in the toolbox to help control nutrient loading uh, emanating from stormwater sources throughout the day. And then last but not least, we want to make sure that our state legislature is aware that uh, many of the municipal fertilizer ordinances are another tool that we have in the toolbox in terms of trying to reduce the amount of nutrient impacts to the bay. And, uh, we want to maintain those strong ordinances as we move forward in the future. Uh, on the federal side, um, we we're trying to build off of the omnibus <laughs> appropriation bill last year that had uh, identified the Little Manti River uh, for a study uh, to seek its designation as a wild and scenic river under the federal government. So that language was actually inserted in the appropriations bill that passed last December. Uh, now we're just uh, relying on that study being conducted and that report going to Congress to uh, get that formal designation. So we want to keep that top of mind for our local delegation uh, to ensure that study gets completed in a timely manner and that uh, you know we will be received favorably by Congress to receive that designation for the Little Manti River system. Uh, also just wanted to briefly mention, I'm sure you guys are sort of tracking what's going on in D.C know that uh, there was some uh, continued resolutions passed this year. There was actually bills uh, introduced related to EPA funding that drastically cut, cut EPA funding by about 40% um, in the works. They're not final as it stands right now. There is still, from what I've found, a language in those, in those bills that would uh, continue to elevate support for that the National Estuary Program. Um, so all this is still sort of a work in progress, but uh, knock on wood, well, hopefully as we go through and uh, this appropriation cycle, we'll still actually see an increase in funding to the National Estuary Programs. The um, language in uh, the House bill that just passed early in November was about a $25,000 bump uh, from EPA to uh, the National Estuary Programs. Again, there's a long way to go in the appropriation cycle, but that still uh, shows the sort of the, the positive support uh, 
bipartisan support for the national history programs uh, throughout the country. So with any, uh, you know, with good, hopefully with uh, good wishes from everyone, we'll continue to see that, that support through this appropriation cycle. Other than that, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a question. Um, the state legislative, the fertilizer, was there, is there, what just passed? Was there something that passed that, can you re recall, I can't quite recall what that was. That yeah, so there's a moratorium on any new fertilizer ordinances being implemented in the state until a, a study by the University of Florida is completed. And that study is supposed to go to the state legislature, I think, by the, the first of this year. I haven't heard of a, a lot of progress being made on that study, so it's probably going to be delayed. Um, but why, why would they have to implement a moratorium? Uh, I mean, it seems odd that they would have to stop everyone from doing the right thing. <laughs> I don't know. Have you been to Tallahassee? Unfortunately, <laughs> yes, I have. Um, so yeah, so depending on the outcomes of that. I was trying to recall what that was and, and okay. It was a study to the, the impacts of the, of the bands and those type of things. And, um, it had a December deadline, which everyone thought was pretty short for a real extent. And it didn't have a lot of money in it to do a real healthy study. So I'm not sure. So it's know. lapsing now in, in December. Is that. There, there was a deadline, right? December yeah, 31st. There's there's a research group assembled through the University of Florida. I've I've not seen any draft products or, or heard of a lot of progress being made on that study uh, as it stands right now. All right. Interesting. Okay. I just couldn't recall. I remember there was something going on and I didn't recall exactly. Yeah. I think we're we there's some more strengthening needed in those. So okay. Look forward to at least to the University of Florida's in charge. So that's good news. Yeah, and depending on the outcomes of the study, again, I think our support at the local level is because of the strong fertilizers that not ordinances that have been in place in the region. We want to continue maintaining those in the region. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I got just a couple of questions, Ed. Um, so these are the legislative priorities, but the legislature is has been meeting in some committees. Is this time? Are you? I mean, you guys are still up there meeting with them in committees and stuff, even though they don't. They start in January. But. Yeah, I've had yeah, individual conversations with our local delegation before the session started, but I haven't done a dedicated trip to Tallahassee uh, probably since the the pandemic, and I've gone there. Yeah, with our uh, other history program directors and kind of give these as our overall priorities throughout the, the four NEPs in, in, in the state. Um, I do each year go up to Washington, D.C. as part of a spring meeting organized by EPA and the Association of National History Programs and have a, a time to meet with our congressional delegation each year. And if the state takes up like the net metering bill or other things that impact climate, our climate, uh, you know, I'm I don't want them messing with our net metering bill to um, reduce the attractiveness of having solar panels um, because I think we need to reduce mm -hmm. carbon emissions and that's the way to do it and all that. Do you all, do you speak or sign on to um, other groups that speak before the committees uh, about those kinds of issues that impact climate change or, you know, our, all that stuff that has a ripple effect, or are you only speaking on things related to our water quality? Well, there's there's a link with our water quality in, in terms of emissions, yeah. and actually Jessica Lewis has been doing a great job of went, going to the local delegation meetings and kind of speaking about these priorities that, that have held since last year. <laughs> so when we talk about improving and enhancing stormwater controls, that has a direct you know correlation to atmospheric emissions uh, from mobile and fixed sources throughout the watershed. So educating and raising awareness on those issues and the importance of um, looking at ways we could reduce those emissions through time is, is a strategy to improve our water quality throughout the coast. So you use your weight and your reputation and all that gravitas to speak about those things as well up in Tallahassee. As, as Don likes me to say, we educate and raise awareness around those issues. We the, don't advocate. <laughs> We don't have any. We advocate. Don't, we don't, we don't advocate. Educate. Okay. 
um, and speaking about educating them. So you've got these legislative priorities. And if you're going to, when you go to Tallahassee and you're educating, do you have one pagers that you leave with the legislators that you can then share with us as those bills are modified or the language is tweaked and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. We, we actually have a general one for the entire national issue programs that we typically distribute. We have one pagers related just to our program activities around our grant funding, like t -Burf, as well as our Bay Mini grants. So if you're interested in having those materials, um, we can provide you with those too. If they're online or something, right? So the 2024 legislative session, and these are the priorities yep. and these are the one pagers we're going to hand out to legislators. Yep. Do you think they get tweaked as language gets changed or they pretty much stay the same? Uh, it depends on the issue. Um, you know, we're still trying to build support and momentum around uh, causeway alterations. Mm -hmm. So we do have an old Tampa Bay uh, policy brief Senator on those issues. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if there's opportunities, these other issues uh, in terms of bill language that comes up yeah i think we would tail them around sort of the education that we would want to provide around that issue and then i guess the last thing and this is you know not to be all narrow or particular about what my city is experiencing now but i hear it's you know regionally um is with artificial turf ordinances and and uh you know the understanding about pros and cons of artificial turf so you've got um Create our strength in engineering policies, best practices, regulatory reviews that prioritize water quality improvements from tidal circulation and stormwater retrofits. Um, but is it strengthened, you know, where would where would watching what goes into our water fit into that? Like the turf, the microplastics and all that stuff. Does it fall into one of these bullets? Uh, enhancing monitoring, I think it, that's most Absolutely. appropriate, like we talked about, the, the microplastic mm -hmm. monitoring and other emerging contaminants. Thanks. Uh, there, there's also a strong desire, at least I have, I have a strong desire for uh, additional continuous monitoring stations in our estuary. Uh, I think we're lagging behind other systems in terms of real-time monitoring that's occurring. So that, that's another talking point it actually brings to that would be funding from the federal government to help that happen we're agnostic to the source okay sure <laughs> <laughs> if you if you brought your p card <laughs> i could see what i could do <laughs> thank you jessica i remember think what you're asking is one pagers on specific bills that are happening in tallahassee and to my knowledge we haven't done that so I think you're talking about two different things here. Um, but the legislative review committee that's part of the ABN, sometimes I'm, I'm part of that, but sometimes we do put together uh, one pagers. They're also just education, not advocacy. Um, so, especially if there's particular bills that you are worried about or you're supportive of or just want to know more about, I encourage you maybe to send Sarah, for instance, to the, the legislative review committee meeting and bring up those concerns. I don't think we currently have a next meeting scheduled that I can follow up with you. Well, thank you. I, I don't have the capacity to monitor specific sure. bills, but it would be more of, you know, your talking points for, you know, best practices in general. That's all. I don't need specific bills stuff. I mean, stuff changes. So, okay. sure. And I don't know that our staff has the, the bandwidth to no. be track, to no. bill tracking every day and all that. Mm. No. Yeah. Or bullets to send out. Yeah. No. Let's do the through our membership through the Florida Stormwater Association, they do actually do a really good job of tracking water-related bills. And that's that's what we're usually monitoring, if there's anything coming up related to the work we're doing. And it poses a concern that we have those discussions here. Yes, sir. Yeah, quick question, Ed, you and I discussed this briefly in the, in the pre-briefing. Um, I know there's certain prohibitions, but I'd wanted to throw out there the opportunities of hiring a federal or state lobbyist you know, in terms of appropriations, direct grants, some of the issues we've been talking about today, I know it's been bantered about for the boards before. Uh, can you kind of give me a, an update on what has happened before and why the, uh, you know, the yesterday program never decided to independently hire a lobbyist? 
Yeah, it's, uh, as far as I've been part of the program, it's never been the direction um, that the board wanted to pursue in terms of hiring a, a specific lobbyist as, as part of our Florida Estuaries Alliance that's been talked about with the other national estuary programs to bring someone aboard and potentially advocate on our, our, our behalf. If we went that route, we would have to use non-federal resources uh, to support that activity. You can touch any of our federal dollars right. that come into the program. But that never perceived that as a program. Uh, but I, I think we're open to it as long as we have- well, is, there not, is there enough discretionary money, non-federal, to, to fund uh, something like that? I would want to approach it like cost sharing with the other uh, NEP directors, mm -hmm. or we'd probably uh, use up our reserves real quick, probably over one or two cycles. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's worth potentially looking at in terms of what the, the appetite is for that, I would think, especially in an ever-changing and political environment, opportunities out there for for you know improving our grant uh, fixtures. Yeah, and I, th I think our our strategies in the past have been leaning on our partners and you know, providing you guys our input on what our priorities are, and, and hopefully using your lobbying resources to get those messages across to your contacts. But if a more direct approach is desired, I think we'd be willing to explore that. That's what's important. Right. Yeah, and we've, at Pinellas, our, our federal lobbyists keep an eye on things and, and help that conversation. It's not obviously pop on their list, because but they uh, our team knows that it's important to our commission. Um, but yeah, you, it'd have to be a joint thing. I mean, you. The conversation was started at hundred thousand dollars, so you know, um, every year. So that you'd have to think about that. You have shared, and you have to figure out how you're going to hire. I mean, it's, but it is. There's, there's definitely value. You just have to decide where that that line is. Well, that's why I throw. Yeah, it. no, absolutely. Yes, sir. Well, we do have we do have a lobbyist through the Association of National Estuary Programs. So not for us specifically, but another pooled resource that's working on the federal side. Well, I would think you'd have to look at the makeup of the legislature pretty frequently to see how much potential there is there. <laughs> you know, am I going to pay a hundred thousand dollars and I have a read that I don't think the needle's going to move that much with with what people have stated. You know, our elected officials. You have to make a judgment call. The probability of success or yeah. not. That kind of begs the question of a hiring a lobbyist, right? Yeah, but. Mm, <laughs> So I, I did want to mention that um, the relationships that the estuary programs have with the Florida Associ Association of Environmental Resource Agencies, CLRA, they're um, they put in their priorities support for the national estuary programs at the state level too for some of these key issues. So, you know, we educate through our networks yeah. as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Stay with us, Don. I Questions or discussion? I just have one thing. I want to pick up on something, Kathleen, the, on the turf and the research. And, and um, we just went to a park opening in Pasco County. It was a beautiful park. They did it for children with um, different abilities. And, but in the park, they put in turf on, in a little section of the park. And our parks department was quite proud of that turf because they didn't have to maintain it and you know that so are we going to be able to like i haven't approached them because i didn't want to burst their bubble right away uh, on the things that i've been learning here but how what's the best approach on that education will you present to our parks department how do we educate our staff and our team members at the county level to understand what it is that the, the trade-offs are on that kind of turf. Yeah, I think the discussions that have been centered in the region, uh, primarily through the agency bay management, there, there are certain applications where turf is probably appropriate, high traffic areas, some right. of the park system, if it's maintained, right. but on a broad scale residential basis, you know, that's where principles of Florida friendly landscaping, uh, using native plants, you know, that's what we're, what we're trying to promote. 
and you know the research centered around residential landscapes will be different than more park or commercial applications. That's good to know because I want to know what the trade-offs are then. At what point do we need to draw the line? Because now, now they're discussing doing soccer fields, which is a significantly bigger area than the small little playground that we did. We certainly want to uh, educate parks and conservation uh, folks that there are those trade-offs and microplastics, heat island effects, those are things that you should be balancing with applications of turf in your jurisdictions. So what's the best approach to, to, to bring that? Because I don't feel versed in being able to articulate the presentations I've seen necessarily. Is, is your team, what was that, uh, there was a name I saw that, that has been doing the presentation, I believe from Stutson, right? Yeah. Are they going to be open to present to uh, to our approach for these types of local implementation activities? That's how it's identified in our comprehensive conservation and management plan okay. has historically been that the estuary program sort of our unique contribution is more on the research side of things. And so that's what we discussed after that presentation that um, what Max presented was a, basically a literature review, not specific studies of you know how turf is addressing or what these trade-offs are that that you all expressed at that at that meeting and so that's i think what council member beckman was talking about is what's the status of actually conducting that research and then once that research you know if it's conducted and we have findings to share we tend to partner with entities like the regional planning council to bring in the practitioners the folks that are working in the planning and zoning departments the stormwater managers the parks folks and then we do this directed outreach that's sort of been the partnership that's that's gone on there the the challenge is right now we don't have that research to present but if we do we will reach out and make sure that all of those applicable departments are you know provided an opportunity to hear the findings okay I'm just anti because I see where this is going in our county and I want to just educate them as quickly as we can so thank you uh, we actually just had a case yesterday about this very thing and um, we still require 25% of uh, a parcel to be green space, like actual living green space. Um, and then apparently we just went through some sort of process where now you can't use the microplastics as the underlayment, you have to use the silica with some sort of tray surface. I'm sure it's still not great, but it's better. Um, but that I thought was very interesting that they're still um, going to hold the line to 25% of a yard must or a, a property must be, yeah. um, which is already the rule they have. But I don't know. I'm I'm also concerned about the heat island effect and the microplastics and the how heat, many yeah. heat mass too, right? Yeah, that, yeah, that popped up. Yeah, think, exactly. I think where we approached it originally in terms of the research questions is, you know, the stormwater related related runoff that it might generate versus natural landscape. So a lot of research is needed around that front. Yeah, it, I, there's a lot of moving parts to it. Uh, I mean, just, well, you don't have to put chemicals down to kill weeds and things and just the maintenance of everything and the trimming and the gas gasoline engines going across all the so it's it it's going to be interesting to see when it whenever we get to that point of what the trade-offs are exactly how um, the best approaches are and i've i've watched especially in my neighborhood as people have added it to their lawns and i don't i mean on the edges the weeds are just as terrible as ever so you still have to handle that to some degree my concern though is like yesterday's application was changing a pd that had already been approved it was an apartment complex and they just wanted to change some of their landscaping to a dog park with turf and the issue of that is you're still watering that because you have to rinse off the, i mean you know every now and again so i mean i understand the benefits but also there are still some costs to that so uh but the one thing that we did stick to is that anytime that you're reducing green space there's an in lieu fee 
And so we're looking at increasing our in lieu fees for that. Um, and my plan is to have that money go toward uh, the closest local park to increase amenities there. But what? you said increasing what kind of fees? In, in lieu? So in lieu of in lieu fees. Yeah, okay. in lieu of having the right amount of green space, you have to pay into a fund. Mm -hmm. And right now that fund just kind of Nobody knows where it goes to, but uh, we want it to go specifically to um, park areas. And this isn't throughout the city, but as, as our city urbanizes and we're not just in the downtown core as it kind of expands a little bit in the in that core area, we are we are building urban buildings that don't have the green space that more suburban buildings have, well, what's the trade-off and where do we uh, incentivize green space that still exists within the urban core? So. One of the things you mentioned that came up last night that I didn't, I didn't jump on when people <laughs> were making the statement, but, you know, and this is part of, I hope, you know, we can get funding and we can have a more comprehensive research, yeah. but, you know, the cost of, mowing and uh, you know exhaust and stuff there are electric lawnmowers we i donate electric lawnmowers to our habitat homeowners in clearwater because i don't want them using gas and uh, so we have electric lawnmowers now and we have these fertilizer bands that reduce the amount of chemicals that go in during rainy season so we're trying to do there are options to really reduce the impact of maintaining a natural Florida friendly lawn. Um, and I would think, I would hope, you know, as we're drive, I was driving in here, you know, let's look ahead, hopefully just 20 or 30 years, that all the lawnmowers are going to be electric and that people, we have a cultural shift that native landscaping is the desired and not everybody has to look like a golf course in their front yard, whether it's fake golf course or you know, grass or whatever, yeah. you know, that's really the idea. I just, for multiple reasons, just turned half of my front yard into a um, pollinator garden. And it's only half of my front yard, but it is significantly less work. Yeah. And now I'm just fighting with my husband to get more of that. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I am, I am actually so pleasantly surprised at, um, and how many pollinators I have in my yard. That's actually the behavioral messaging around yeah. our Beef Floridian campaign. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Yeah, ideally, if you're using Florida native landscapes, you can use less water, less chemical fertilizers in the long run. Just have such a prettier yard. <laughs> less expensive? I mean, well, those are the same money. I don't know about less expensive because I really love to buy plants. <laughs> All right. Okay. Further questions, discussions on the legislative priorities? Is there a motion to accept? Motion to accept legislative priorities. Second. We have a motion, second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, no, I'm not opposed. I just had it. <laughs> Show it passes unanimously. I, I just think that this conversation also just really shows the, the um, desire to really do as much as we can around this artificial turf conversation. So I just want to second what you had said earlier, and I think conversation really shows that um, we, we need to, to put this in the forefront for many of our communities before we lose. That's what I'm afraid of. Because yeah. if we if we modify this ordinance that we have that prevents it, so we have 25 families at least that have got it in now, spending thousands and thousands of dollars. So they're wanting us to change the ordinance to allow it. And then, and then there's all sorts of things about, are we gonna permit it, inspect it? How long does it last? They're telling me it's recyclable. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, what does that really mean? But but if we allow it, which it looks like that's the way it's going, this compromise, we're gonna allow it, but you have to have these standards. It's the cost of enforcing. Are we really gonna be able to enforce? And then you just like let it out of the, horses yeah. out of the barn yeah. and here it comes and you just can see it coming. Um, and, and we all live around water here, you know, because some some ordinances, I think, were 
you know, you can't have it within so many feet of the water, or it can't be on a tree drip line, or, you know, and who's gonna, who's gonna really go out and how do you enforce that realistically? I mean, we're all understaffed. And so it's just, a, it's a scary thing kind of coming. I believe we just revisited ours. So you may want to have someone from They did here. mention Tampa allows it some places. So you know Yes, what? but we like I said, we from what I understood yesterday, they just changed some of their guidelines. So you may want to have somebody from the city reach out and see what those changes are. I if I had known we were gonna have this conversation, I might have uh, gotten some more information, although I probably wouldn't have it by now, but I, now I have a note to, to look more into it for our next meeting. Okay. All right, item number seven, interim CCMP update. Ms. Burton. So this item is culminating more than a year's worth of work uh, that we've done in collaboration with Schaefer Consulting and many of the folks on your uh, various staff. Um, we've conducted extensive outreach amongst our management conference and stakeholders within the community. And essentially, I'm going to be summarizing some of the updates that we're proposing to our guiding document, our Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan, or CCFP, um, for the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. This document it was um, last revised in 2017, um, and it's for a 10-year planning horizon. And so this interim update is that five-year interim assessment. We're not looking to overhaul anything that's in the CCMP. We're merely trying to reflect the, the best state of current research and um, any kinds of changes or plan updates, things that have already been before this board or other boards um, and have been approved, make sure that those changes are incorporated and reflected in our comprehensive conservation and management plan. Since it's our guiding document, it's public facing, we wanna make sure that um, we're, we're pointing to the best available information overall. So this was a lot of work and there are a lot of changes and I'm doing my best to distill all of those changes into a relatively brief presentation today. But if you have any questions and you want to stop me to dig in deeper, I'm more than happy for y'all to interrupt and we can have that conversation as things are going along. So I want to start by um, talking about some of the proposed changes that we're recommending for our um, goals in the CCMP. Um, there's, there's really two major changes that I want to call your attention to. This isn't all of the goals. These are the goals that have changes to them. Um, and the two major changes here that I want to call your attention to are one to the Bay Habitats action. This goal is changed to reflect the, the progress that we've made when we adopted the Habitat Master Plan in 2020, so several years after we, we had adopted the revised CCMP in 2017. So what's proposed here is completely consistent with that Habitat Master Plan that was adopted in 2020. Um, the other thing that I want to call to your attention in terms of changes that are up here that are notable um, to the climate change action, um, earlier guidance from our policy board and others had us focusing really on the effects of sea level rise and how it would influence potential habitat change over time. Um, but in the intervening years between now and 2017, our work has really grown to cover, cover things like temperature change, changing rainfall patterns, ocean acidification, and sea level rise. And so we wanted to make sure that there is language in the goals that is capturing the breadth and depth of that work as well as we wanted to incorporate the aspect of community resilience. Before it was really focused on just habitat, and now, we want, now we're also incorporating elements related to things like water quality and the community as a whole. So there were a number of changes that we're proposing to the Water Quality and Sediment Action Plan. Um, I'm going to summarize that each action has a series, a series of components um, to, to it. They have a background section, activities, there's who's who the responsible party is, what the deliverables are, costs, funding sources, all those kinds of things. So I'm just going to kind of try and summarize all of the changes that were made within this water quality and sediment, um, sediment quality action plan. In the background, the notable changes are to reflect things like the 2022 Reasonable Assurance Plan that we, um, that the Nitrogen Management Consortium completed and submitted to the US EPA and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection back in December of last year. Um, notably, that's also including changes to the status and trends for the things that we're observing um, in recent history in Old Tampa Bay. 
things that we've talked about a lot here at this board. We're also reflecting um, new legislation and ordinances that have passed in that time period, things like the 2020 Clean Waterways Act, Senate Bill 64, and the passage of Hillsborough County's new residential fertilizer ordinance to come into alignment with some of the other fertilizer um, ordinances throughout the region. And also to reflect completed research on microplastics, PFAS, wastewater treatment plant vulnerability to rainfall um, and sea level rise, as well as new research and better understanding of pyridinium, the harmful algae bloom that we see in Old Tampa Bay. Changes to the activities that we're recommending are to make sure that we're capturing things like the assimilative capacity assessment for Old Tampa Bay, um, work that we're gonna be talking about later here in this meeting. Um, we also, we, we collect information from many of your, your staff folks on projects that have been completed to reduce a nitrogen load to the bay. We, that information is all entered into the action plan database and it is feeds into our nitrogen loading summary and our reasonable assurance plan um, uh, re annual reporting. Um, and we've heard back from many of our partners that that's a pain point, the way that that, that database functions. And so we wanna modernize that database. So we've included that as an action. Um, we've also, based on some of the trends that we've been observing in Old Tampa Bay, we want to include an action uh, to better, to research and better understand the linkages between nitrogen loads, macroalgae, and seagrass coverage. This is information that was included in the Southwest Florida Water Management District's um, Surface Water Improvement or SWIM plan that was just updated um, for Tampa Bay, as well as uh, things that we've observed um, in recent years in relation to Piney Point, as well as just again, those trends that we're seeing in Old Tampa Bay in particular. Uh, then there are several activities with information related to nutrient removal and performance standards for septic that are associated with that new legislation. Um, having activities that are encouraging upgrades to wastewater treatment standards beyond just AWT. Um, improving public messaging when fecal indicator bacteria pose an actual risk to public health because we know just because the indicator bacteria is present doesn't mean that it's necessarily something that is a danger to human health. And so we want to communicate more accurately around that. And then adding in some of the work that has already been um, supported and conducted with, as it relates to PFAS and uh, microplastics, like work that we've done for participatory science on the NERDLE patrol. We made several changes um, to the responsible parties, basically uh, things like adding the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to septic related activities. This was the change in state responsibility associated with some of that legislation that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then adding some um, potential regional convening organizations like the Southwest Florida Water Management District and the Regional Planning Council as working group participants. Adding our academic um, partners for microplastics monitoring because Eckerd College has done a lot of that foundational work here in the Tampa Bay area. And so we wanna recognize their contributions both past and going forward. And then adding Keep America Beautiful affiliates to plastic pollution prevention education because they've also been doing a lot of work educating the community on, the, on microplastics and plastic pollution in general. There's a couple of changes to time frame within this action, uh, within this action plan uh, to reflect work that has either been completed or delayed. So for example, we've completed a nutrient management framework for tidal tributaries in partnership with the other Southwest Florida um, National Estuary programs. Um, we also completed phase one of the pipe up campaign to um, encourage folks to inspect and repair lateral sewer lines. And we have some items that are delayed. We still think they're important, but we don't have um, a, clear, a clear plan for when that work will be completed. That includes things like expanding landscape best management practice certification, adding an atmospheric deposition monitoring station within the watershed, um, starting a regional septic issue working group, and completing sediment quality action plans for McKay Bay and Largo Inlet. Um, there's one change to costs and potential funding sources. Essentially, there's been so much federal resources that are available to support many of these wastewater related activities. We wanted to make sure we're recognizing that in the plan, pointing to things like the ARPA, the bill, and the IRA funding sources um, for those wastewater treatment associated improvements. And then a couple of changes to the deliverables here. One is to specify open science formats for many of the things that were outlined, um, which is consistent with the 2021 strategic plan. And then to specify the next iteration of the reasonable assurance plan, which is due to the US EPA and to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection in 2027. 
that was all of water and sediment quality. Any questions or yes? Nice. The upgraded septic systems. Yes, ma'am. Costco's finally come into the table. We're going to have our BMAC areas where we're, we have a partnership with the state of Florida to, to help residents in those BMAP areas. Is there any, um, any ability to stretch that? Like we have our coastline that has a lot of septic, but it's not in the BMAP area. So is there going to be any kind of um, hunger in the state of Florida to address those areas, even not in a BMAP area with those kind of upgraded benefits to residents? So I think there's the, the state is likely prioritizing funding uh, towards areas that are in a BMAP or in a spring shed, and that's that seems to be the, the approach that they've been taking. Um, but that's not to say or to preclude other work to, to to encapsulate our our region as a whole, and um, those activities related to the establishment of a septic working group um, is something that um, potential working group participants or folks like the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council who work in that coastal area as well as your more inland areas of your county. So I think if there's uh, an appetite to tackle this at a regional scale beyond just the Tampa Bay watershed, but the uh, the Tampa Bay region as a whole, I think that that makes a whole lot of sense and there's opportunity there. We haven't gone in, oh, go ahead, Ed. Finish your thought. I was just gonna say that that working group hasn't actually been established. It's something that's been repeatedly recognized as an important issue, one with there's interest, but there hasn't been a champion that's established that working group and really started to tackle this challenge. And so I would also invite you know, Pasco County. If Pasco County wanted to be the champion on that issue, we would be able to lend our support as one expert as part of that working group. Um, but, you know, this is an activity that is in need of a champion in order to, to make progress on this issue. Yeah, the only thing to add is, you know, the importance of monitoring where there's a potential indication that there's fecal coliform pollution or other human mm -hmm. sources of sewage pollution. So once it's monitored, it could be listed as an impairment and then go through the TMBL and BMAP process. And at that point, those areas would be uh, open to advanced septic sort of incentives that are being developed. And you mean in a way that helps the residents? And so, because we, it, it uses, just lying, we've, you, we're impaired. I mean, Hudson is. <laughs> if you're su suspecting an impairment, but there's no monitoring data to support that, then they won't be identified as a TMDL or BMAP area. Well, we're, we're in a microsource tracking study right now. So, but but there's just the funding is so limited to just those BMAP areas. It's it it's painful to know that there's a way more areas of our county that could benefit from this kind of a program. So to see the the limiting, I mean, I get they have to start somewhere, but I'm hopeful. You know, and I'd love to have further discussion on how to how to move forward discussion to expand that that the need in in because the water quality is just so important. And well, I think also many local governments are prioritizing wastewater um, and like infrastructure upgrades, whether it's septic sewer conversions or other things. They're prioritizing the federal funding that they have more control over to, to incentivize in those areas that are outside of a, a designated VMAC area. And so I would say that that's like another tool that's in the, count, the county's toolbox. Um, but again, probably having a working group that's sort of talking about like the best, the best approaches, the lessons learned, you know, tips and tricks between local governments that are all trying to navigate this issue would be beneficial and that's really what this activity um, in particular is calling for. Thank you. Yep. We're, we have actually in this 24 uh, budget where we've we've gonna actually do design work to start converting some septic over so um, but it, it's still only scratching the surface it's not enough so thank you. All right Bay Habitats is my next stop. Uh, this is where I expected the majority of the changes to be because of that um, adoption of the 2020 Habitat Master Plan. And so there are quite a few changes here. To the background, um, we are uh, 
make, reflecting the changes that are in the adopted habitat master plan. So there's a number of changes related to the status and trends of different habitat types and the associated targets and goals for each of those habitat types, as well as changing um, the language to reflect our new management paradigm of maximizing the potential, the movement away from restoring the balance. Um, we're reflecting uh, the 2023 update for the Surface Water Improvement Management Plan for Tampa Bay. It had the, that plan had was last updated in 1999, so this was uh, a much needed update, and so we were happy to be able to reflect those changes in the Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan for Tampa Bay because those two documents do work hand in glove. And then there's also some changes to reflect um, the updated minimum flows and levels priority list and schedule and the minimum flows and levels reevaluation reports. Um, that's all work that's done by the Southwest Florida Water Management District and is very relevant to the activities identified in this action in this action plan. And then we're also reflecting um, re recently completed research about wetland constructed wetland fun habitat function, seagrass propeller sparring, um, and an associated behavior change campaign work that we've done to map hard bottom throughout Tampa Bay, an oyster habitat suitability index and monitoring protocols for oyster restoration, um, as well as participatory science efforts to install vertical oyster gardens um, in, in folks' backyard. So those are all changes that are, that are reflected in the background so that we're consistent with those most up-to-date um, plans and documents. On the activity side, the major change I want to call your attention to is we are uh, merging what was formerly known as Bay Habitats 10, the Freshwater Ma Wetland Master Plan Implementation, with BH1, which is Habitat Master Plan Implementation. Previously, these two documents, um, they, these were separate documents. We were working to understand the status and trends of freshwater wetlands up in the watershed, and so it was done as a companion piece to our Habitat Master Plan. But the 2020 Habitat Master Plan encompasses all of the habitat types from subtitle, like in the water, all the way up to coastal uplands and freshwater wetlands, you know, deep into Polk County, Hillsborough County, and on the sort of far reaches of the watershed. Um, so those, those two documents are now really all in the Habitat Master Plan. And furthermore, that freshwater master plan that we had created was reflecting the, the old management paradigm of restoring the balance. And with the new Habitat Master Plan, uh, we have this maximizing the potential approach, which changes how we do the target and goal setting. So we're recommending merging BH10 with BH1. Any of the relevant activities that are, that are still consistent with the Habitat Master Plan that relate specifically to freshwater, wetland mass, freshwater wetlands are included now in BH1. We also are adding several activities that talk about creating opportunities for upslope habitat migration, adding habitat uh, restoration design projects for resilience, um, components beyond just uh, habitat mosaics and sea level rise, um, but also things like ways we can create temperature refugia and other things like that. And then adding research on transplanting, genetic diversity, and viruses that might enhance, that might be used to enhance the resilience of seagrass meadows. These are conversations that we've been having, particularly with our technical advisory committee, um, in light of the, the significant losses of seagrass that we've observed in Tampa Bay. And so we want to make sure that these activities are also reflected in the CCMP. So in Bay Habitats, there's also several changes we're proposing to the responsible parties, adding things like the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, some local governments and those entities that have um, permitting incentives and permit regulatory authority for living shorelines. Previously, it was a very limited list of, of um, regulatory agencies that were there, so we want it to be encompassing all of those who have a regulatory interest in living shorelines. And then um, there was an oversight in, this, in an activity related to the critical coastal habitat assessment where we didn't identify private consultants as a potential partner. And since we have contracted that work in the past with private consultants, we want to reflect that there. Changes to the time frame, work that's been completed. We completed that habitat master plan, which was one of the activities that we had identified in the 2017 revision of the CCMP. Um, we completed establishing living shoreline monitoring protocols. Um, we have some delays on, on this work. Most of it's related um, to the comprehensive management of tidal tributaries, 
or things that are related to various efforts associated with uh, mitigation banking and how we can work with private sector partners to accomplish some of the goals included in the Habitat Master Plan. In the cost and funding source, we wanted to add an additional source because the state has been appropriating funds. They have had a line item appropriation to support seagrass transplanting throughout the state, and some of that is occurring within Tampa Bay. So we want to recognize that. And there are no changes to the deliverables. Any questions about bay habitats? Can I ask a question? Absolutely. You, you, um, great. I mean, this is wonderful work. I, I, I need to dive into the document much deeper, but when you're talking about the living shorelines at that symposium we just attended over at the Port of Tampa, the first thing the professor led with was talking about living shorelines, but using it in the way that we're using green, green and gray infrastructure. So the use of, of both types in order to address sea level rise. So is, are we talking about adding gray infrastructure into any of this plan? Gray infrastructure is already included in our CCMP activities related to living shorelines. We talk about a gray to green continuum Good. and how okay. there are appropriate solutions along that continuum depending on the different applications. That's information that's not a revision that was previously the way we okay. approached it. That's why I haven't read it. Okay. It's largely driven by the site specific conditions. So right. if there's a lot more energy, then it's gonna be a little bit more gray there's less energy than right. a, a mix of gray to green. I just it's found that reason. when the professor said that's the direction everything's going, he, he emphasized that in his, I forgot the gentleman's name that led the, that was in Maine or where, wherever he broadcast from, um, but he was, he was very informative and he just stressed the importance of the gray and green in the hybrid approach. So, okay, good to know it's in there. I did. I wasn't aware. Thank yeah, you. Anything that's creating more complexity around just a vertical seawall face is usually right. beneficial. To it is. Way. It is. I totally agree. But it's just making sure we have them both at the table. That there's probably not any one answer. There's a lot there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're not just tree huggers. No, no. <laughs> No, but, Wait, what? <laughs> oh, but it, I've, I mentioned that. I mean, there was some in some of the other meetings, not at this meeting, but I was just curious because I only saw green here and I was just double checking. Thank you. All right. A couple of changes to the Fish and Wildlife um, Action Plan. There, in the background of the Fish and Wildlife Action Plan, there's quite a bit of information on uh, things like the number of voter registrations throughout our region, and so we've uh, updated that with the most recent data that's available. Uh, we've also updated the background to, to incorporate information from recently completed research related to things like scallop recruitment, the hard bottom habitat in fish communities, and sport fish habitat utilization at restored sites throughout the watershed. And so the, that, the, the background details are all now reflecting the, the sort of best, best available information with respect to those items. A couple of changes to the activities for fish and wildlife. One is to expand support and expand participatory science initiatives, which is something that is included in our strategic plan. And so we're trying to make sure that there, where there are opportunities that are relevant to the Fish and Wildlife Act, Action Plan, that those are incorporated there as well. Um, we are deleting an activity because it's redundant with Bay Habitats 1, BH1. Essentially, the, the management philosophy behind protecting and restoring habitats is for the benefit of fish and wildlife that rely on them. And so we have this redundant activity in the Fish and Wildlife Action to implement the Habitat Master Plan. But because we already have all of that information in the Bay Habitat 1s, we thought that one action that we thought we could take, take that out of the Fish and Wildlife. Um, action plan, and then um, to add monitoring programs for key species to adapt to new conditions or threats like land use change or climate change. This is a topic that's come up um, particularly with our technical advisory committee and some of the research priorities that they've expressed, um, and so we wanted to reflect those, those activities within this action plan. 
Um, there's a few changes to the responsible parties. The Manatee Awareness Coalition that we convene and just because the staff lead for has requested uh, to be responsible for monitoring any changes to Manatee Protection Zones, and so we're recommending to add them as a responsible party there. And then adding other national estuary programs, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, uh, non-governmental and academic partners to conduct some of the collaborative research that's identified because those are typically the entities that are doing that work with us. Um, timelines, work that was completed, we did conduct through the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund a recruitment a study, a recruitment study for scallop populations. And then um, work that is delayed, we um, have here that this an intent or a desire to establish a task force uh, to, to achieve additional funding for enhanced on water enforcement. This is something that's been particularly important to the agency on bay management stakeholders. Um, however, there has not been a, this, this task force convened um, and there is no champion for this for this activity. So we've left it on here but with a delayed with a delayed time frame because we haven't seen any progress on this particular activity. And then um, no changes to the cost or funding sources and to the deliverables where, where particular deliverables are identified. We're specifying our open science formats, which again, consistent with our 2021 strategic plan. That would be things like the fisheries health index, the nectin index that we report on every year, the benthic index, the looking at the sediments and the, the contaminants that might be in those sediments, things like that, uh, making sure that we're reporting on those in the open science workflows that we've identified as the way that we're delivering science to the community. Any questions about fish and wildlife? It's a lot of pages and a lot of actions. <laughs> so oh, you guys are troopers. I want to make sure you're knowledgeable about everything that's in there. So I'm combining two action plans um, here on this slide. This is uh, changes that we're proposing to dredging and dredge material management, as well as spill prevention and response. Um, so there are a couple of big things that we wanted to make sure that we're reflecting in the background information for these two action plans. One is related to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers completion of a regional sediment management plan for Tampa Bay and the estuary program's completion of a dredge hole assessment looking at an additional 11 dredge holes in the, in the bay to figure out whether or not they might benefit from some management intervention. And then in the spill prevention and response, obviously, we needed to reflect the, the events over the past few years related to the Piney Point discharge and then the most recent um, oil, oil spill that was uh, detected at Port Manatee earlier this year. So that, those, those information are all now included in the background for those two action plans. Um, in the activities, in the spill prevention and response, there are several changes that are um, proposed related to maintaining the, the booms, the protective booms that, are, that we have in the event of an oil spill that we're able to deploy to protect environmentally sensitive shorelines and restoration sites. Um, this has been a priority for the Area Spill Committee, um, and they have staged and done work to make sure that the boom that's located at E.G. Simmons Park, that we know where it is, and that it's being inspected regularly and maintained appropriately so that um, when that, when and if that boom ever needs to be deployed, that it's not um, dry rotted or we don't know where it is, um, those kinds of things. So those are the change, that's the change to the activities. Adding um, some a couple of changes to the responsible parties, both the Regional Planning Council and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, um, to some of the, the permitted the discussions about and the permitting for the beneficial uses of dredge material, uh, particularly as it relates to um, new dredging projects that may be proposed um, for like the Tampa Harbor Channel Channel Deepening Project um, over the course of this um, next five-year period. And then um, on the time frame, projects that were completed, that regional sediment management plan and the dredge hole assessment, projects that are delayed, those are largely research initiatives related to the impacts of different dredging operations or beach nourishment activities on um, wildlife. Uh, so those actions are listed as delayed. We're not aware of anyone taking, uh, taking the lead on conducting that research or establishing a best management practice um, manual for how to, how to conduct that kind of work. No changes to funding or deliverables here. Questions, comments on these actions? Yeah, we got a little one. Dredged hole? Can you just, I mean, can you just talk to me about what a dredged hole is? I mean, I know we have dredged channels and maybe boat docks, and then you mentioned something about using that dredged material for some reason. How do you use it? 
Well, for judge tolls, um, so many of many of the um, land mass that's around in our watershed is constructed land, and so um, sometimes those dredge those dredge holes look like a canal or a channel where boating is occurring, but sometimes they were just literally like a, a dugout hole, and then there was no effort ever made to restore that bay bottom to its natural elevation. And so we have these artificially deep areas in some portions of the bay. Some of them, um, some of those, some of those dredge holes are actually really great habitat for fish in particular. They create like a hideout spot. A lot of fishermen are very familiar with these with, with these places. They're you know secret rock kind of kind of deal. But sometimes the holes are too deep and so you don't have the oxygen at the, the bottom. Um, sometimes you have poor sediment quality down there. Um, so sometimes they're not being used and they're essentially a dead zone. And so these studies are looking at which dredge holes are providing a unique habitat niche for fish and don't require any intervention or which ones are not healthy, aren't providing habitat. And that would be if we restored, um, say, the, the grade of the bay bottom to something within the photic zone, the light, where light can penetrate to the bottom, we might be able to get seagrasses to come back. And so. That's sort of our interest in the dredge hole study and the work that we've done to sort of characterize all of that. And yeah, there's a bunch of those dredge holes. I'll send you the link to the dredge hole report. You can see the map of all of them and you can see which ones we've studied and which ones we haven't had to study yet. Um, uh, so that's what that's what those are. And uh, so when, your next question is about the beneficial use of dredge material. So when the Army Corps, for example, has to do a maintenance dredge for any of the, the ports throughout, um, throughout Tampa Bay, um, they have to do something with material that's coming uh, you know, to, to reestablish the elevation. And so there is an offshore disposal site where they can take that dredge material and they can put it on a barge and send it out a couple of miles into the Gulf of Mexico to use that dredge disposal site. But as you might be able to expect, the cost to recover, to remove that material and then ship it offshore is pretty high. And so the Corps is always looking for lower cost alternatives, which are also providing some kind of environmental benefit. When the dredge materials have um, a, a poorer quality, like there's lots of clays and fines in the materials, a lot of times there's not another alternative. Um, so that's why we created the, the, the there's if you look at a map of Tampa Bay and Hillsborough Bay, there's two big constructed spoil islands, 2D and 3D. And um, those are sites within Tampa Bay that reduce that, that cost and that travel time for that dredged material. Um, and then it's, it's an opportunity to manage, to use those facilities and then manage it for the benefit of like birds, nesting shorebirds and things like that. So that's an example of a beneficial use of dredged material. Uh, so, there's a lot of questions around dredge material right now because currently there is a, a Tampa Harbor navigation study that's underway um, where they're looking at adding an additional 10 feet of depth to the major channels throughout the Traverse Tampa Bay. They're doing this to accommodate the increased you know, sizes of ships for shipping traffic and bringing in goods. Um, to the different ports and harbors in Tampa Bay. And much of this material, because it's an additional 10 feet, is going to be clean, sandy, fill, and lime And so there's higher demand um, for folks that want to consider a way that they might be able to use that material for you know, some kind of restoration project, whether it's a hard bottom restoration project or some sort of coastal habitat. Mosaic that they want to that they want to implement, and so many of these conversations have been going through the agency on bay management um, to talk about what the region wants to see, what the most appropriate projects um, might be for those materials, if and when they're generated for a deepening project. Does that answer your question? That's fascinating. Yes, <laughs> it's been really good. It's really good. Oh yeah, Maya. Depending on the content, as you probably know, that some some high limestone content at uh, dredge material can be used in the formation of aggregate for road building. And FDOT has a program to look at that, but again, it's very dependent on, uh, on the actual mix of the, of the dredge. Yeah, the quality of the material is key for its appropriate use. You know, just for like a history thing, one of the, the major accomplishments over the past, the past decade or so was uh, approving alternative criteria for the quality of the settlement to re-nourish Egg Maquis because Egg Maquis is eroding so rapidly 
And for these beach areas where um, they're not getting some of the tourism dollars and funding streams to support nourishment, they're, they become sediment starved. And so being able to use some of this lower quality but not poor quality sediment to restore things like egg maquis um, is something that a lot of folks in the community are very proud of. So working hand in glove with the core on these things um, is continues to be of interest in the region. I'm combining three action plans on this slide. Uh, invasive species, public access, and public education and involvement. Um, the background of these different act action plans are reflecting our most recent give a day for the Bay performance metrics um, before they stopped in 2017, so we want to capture what's happened more recently. Um, reflect some of the completed uh, plans that the program has adopted um, that have been before this board, such as our strategic plan, the equity strategy for the bipartisan infrastructure law, and some of the research conducted on the economic valuation of Tampa Bay. And then in the background, we also want to reflect in this, uh, in this public access portion the passage of the Manatee County land acquisition referendum that allows them to um, secure bonds to support environmental land acquisition. That was something that happened um, over this past five-year period. Most of the changes to the activities are to reflect um, some of the, the stakeholder engagement um, interviews that were conducted by part of the Schaefer team. Um, and so we're wanting to make sure that our outreach activities are tailored to the interests, needs, and unique characteristics of local communities. Um, and we're trying to, we think about equity really broadly, whether that's geographic equity, so that all of our member governments are having some opportunity to engage with their work, whether it's a rural population or a coastal population, um, or whether it's a, a community that's reflective of one of the demographics that we've identified in our bipartisan law equity strategy. Um, we also want to encourage and provide support for members of underserved communities to um, apply for and benefit from our grant funding programs. We want to increase volunteerism among college students and corporate groups. These were things that were specifically identified in our strategic plan. Um, there's a new activity to update our communications and outreach plan. We last um, adopted a new a communications and outreach plan back in 2018, and so we think it's time to revise that given how the communications, uh, especially in the digital space, has shifted so much over the past, few, past year or so. Um, to reduce inequities to access to public lands and support experiential education opportunities for underserved communities so that those folks are able to have those chances to fall in love with and enjoy the Bay to help make them um, better to better protectors of it. Um, we've added several non-governmental organizations and stakeholders which were identified in an equitable engagement memo summarizing the stakeholder feedback from those interviews that our, that our consultant conducted. Um, and then in terms of time frame, there are some delays in establishing an inventory of invasive species. This is something that the Suncoast CISMA, or Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, is responsible for, and they haven't made progress on that. There are changes to cost or funding source, and again, to the deliverables specifying those metrics that we've already identified in the adopted strategic plan. Any questions about these three action plans? We're almost there, guys. You're doing great. You're doing good. If you've got the abbreviated version, the management board had something a little bit longer. <laughs> All right, the last two are climate change and local implementation. The background documents are reflecting changes to the, the 2019 recommended projection of sea level rise throughout the Tampa Bay region. The Regional Resiliency Coalition has adopted a Regional Resiliency Action Plan. We've completed a climate vulnerability assessment and we've conducted additional two rounds of critical coastal habitat assessment. So we're including all of that information um, in the background there. Um, we're also in the background including information related to voluntary carbon markets and sequestration projects, particularly that our partners in Manatee County and Hillsborough County um, have initiated or completed and then reflecting some of the research on temperature trends in shallow seagrass meadows that you all are familiar with because we presented on uh, some of that um, to you recently earlier this year. For the activities, we've got broadly research across the various climate stressors. So I mentioned before, most of our efforts and activities in the CCMP were targeted to sea level rise alone, um, but we have been doing work on a broader array of climate stressors like rainfall, temperature, sea level, and sea level rise. So we're broadening that language where it's included in the activities. 
And then um, for the local implementation, we've got a goal to improve um, implementation reporting um, so that we're more accurately characterizing the progress and contributions that you all in your respective organizations are helping us make towards all of the goals and activities identified in the CCMP. So that's a new activity. Um, time frame, some of the things that were completed, there were very specific um, actions related to creating a crosswalk between our, our comprehensive conservation and management plan and each of your local community government comprehensive plans. Um, we completed that work in partnership with the Regional Planning Council and then conducted several training events with the local planners and practitioners throughout the region. And we additionally presented that work at the Florida, the Florida Association of um, Planners. So that work is completed, no changes to um, funding or Yes. Quick question on the sea level rise projections that are reflecting the 2019 recommended sea level rise. And I, this might be something we could address offline, but what NOAA model are you using? Is that based off of 2019 NOAA sea level rise models or is that? Yes. Something, is there a document that? There is. Okay. There's a, I'll send you the, the, the link. And okay. I expect it to be um, updated again. The climate science advisory panel has basically been holding off on adopting a new recommendation for next level. Okay. Basically, we're, we're waiting for the state to officially accept and release the flood hub report. Um, and so we're trying not to like get out of sync, even though the National Climate Assessment and all of those subsequent documents have already have been out there. So that my mind and answered my follow-up question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> was, was provided um, earlier this year. There just has not been official exceptions from the state. So that's really the, the hold up. Okay, so all of these changes, all of this language was included on this link in your packet, um, but I've tried to summarize it really comprehensively so you all feel very comfortable that you know what we changed in that document. If you approve, um, if, if you approve the, the changes today, what happens next is we submit um, all of the proposed uh, changes to the, to the EPA. Um, including our updated research priorities and an updated finance plan, again, items that were linked in the packet as well. Um, and that's basically, they, they have to uh, accept and concur that we've met all of the criteria. They have like a check a checkbox and guidelines that we have to follow. We follow their checkbox protocol and their guidelines all along the way, so we don't expect there to be any issue there, but we do have to provide that to them for their review and acceptance. Um, Concurrent with this, we're also working on rolling out a new web-based format that incorporates open science workflows. Um, so right now, the document, the, the Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan is published as an Adobe e-zine on the web, um, but we're looking at making it a more searchable and interactive web um, interface. And so we'll be demoing that with you um, probably early next year. Ed would like me to have it ready for you in February. I'll do my best, but May might be more realistic. Um, and then, as I mentioned in the in the, one of the new activities, um, Carly and the rest of the staff have been working on um, beginning to, out, to update the communication and outreach plan. And so that's a, that's another item that we'll be bringing back for your consideration at a future board meeting. This is an action item. Um, the management board considered and heard an even longer version of this presentation, um, and their recommendation is that you all approve the recommended text changes to the CCMP goals, actions, and activities. I think Mr. Holt wanted to hear the longer version. <laughs> <laughs> that was very, very good and, and uh, very thorough um, for our purposes and uh, a lot of good information to share. We appreciate it. Are there further questions or discussion? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just wanted to say how impressive it is to really look at it holistically at the last five years. It's, it's a testament to all the work you all do and you should be very proud of that. It was, it was almost just like a, hey, you know, these are all the things we have done, and so congratulations to you. It's, it's really good. Uh, we do have a lot of new members on the board and, and new staff, so to go through this some, uh, every once in a while uh, to show that, like you said, global perspective is really good. Yes, Ed? Yeah, I just want to recognize Maya's effort in that. This is our blueprint of where we direct our staff resources, our fiscal resources, and it's no, no small task to go through a couple hundred page document. And, she did that quicker this time in the policy board meeting. So every time she's delivered it, I get, I'm even more impressed by the way she's able to distill down the changes. But 
uh, it was no small feat to go through that document and update it with all the work that has been done. So I wanted to commend her for her work on this. And I want to thank every one of your staffs because we don't complete things if you all are active as our partners. And I also want to give a special recognition to Jennifer Schaefer, who's also available online. She really set me up for success and was my partner in going through all of this and collaborating with the, the community as a whole. And so I appreciate all of that. All right. Uh, is there a motion to approve the recommended changes? So moved. Seconded. We have a motion second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Show it passes unanimously. Item number eight, Bay Mini Grants. Uh, Jessica, Lewis. Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm starting to take over the Bay Mini Grant program from Sheila to free her up for some other things. So this is my first year going through it. So feel free to, you know, put me under the fire a little bit. Um, revenue from the, as a reminder, revenue from the tarpon tag specialty license plate sales are what support the Bay Mini Grant program. Um, we distribute them to the community to support our mission. And uh, we currently only use it for Bay Mini Grants. We'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about that in a moment. Um, they are provided to the community, meaning nonprofits, businesses, schools and universities, and sometimes local governments. Um, for environmental restoration and or education projects with a focus on engaging and informing the community at large. Um, up to $5,000 can be awarded per project and it has to be completed in one calendar year. So the, the projects that you're seeing before you now would be completed in 2024. This year we had about $100,000 made available for projects and we advertised Bay Mini Grants and seven at least seven different publications both print and digital um, did a pretty good job of trying to spread it out across the entire watershed to um, reach everyone we received 44 applications totaling um, a little over two hundred thousand dollars so i think we did a great job of getting it out there that's the most number of applications that we've gotten in the last few years uh, but it did mean we had to pare it down by half to <laughs> be able to um, fund those projects so a subset of the community advisory committee volunteers get together to review those applications and provide findings to Ed, who ultimately made this recommendation for you. So they, the CAC members, pared it down to 23 projects that you see here, totaling $98,542. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of great projects recommended for 2024. Note that the projects that are not currently recommended that does not mean that they are bad projects by any means but we will do i will do a, um, a very pointed outreach to those applicants to let them know how they can improve their application for next year and hopefully come back with a stronger application i think that's all i have to tell you so the action before you is to approve uh, funding of the mini grants based on findings of the Community Advisory Committee and Executive Director recommendations, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the point here. Yes, ma'am. I think I might have to recuse myself. I think I've issued a letter of support for one of these from any vote on an action on this, so I don't know if that impacts quorum for a vote. Is it because the city is, is involved? The city has written a letter of support for one of the grants before but, you but vote. Writing a letter of support in my opinion, doesn't create a conflict. Even if I was a signatory on that letter of support. Right. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? What? So we're at a hundred thousand a year from the tag. Is that? Do you know what how we're doing in the, as far as our tag revenue? That's an Ed question, probably. I think <laughs> but that's something we're going to talk about in a moment. Actually, is potentially other ways that we might use tag revenue um, for more than just the Bay Mini Grant program. But I'll. Maybe wait until we get the You know how revenue is doing? Yeah, what we try to make available is what we're bringing in on a year to year basis. As it stands right now, I think last year we we're about 107000 around in terms of tag revenue. So we made 100000 available. We always you know, are, are fairly selective about the projects we're funding. So we are actually building up reserves. We have about three hundred to 400000 in reserve funds from the specialty license plate. And Jessica's going to talk about uh, potential options of using some of those reserve funds. And, um, but as far as like, there was a year where we dipped really low and then we kind of bounced. I was just trying to get a, a long term of how, how many plates, you know, 
Yeah, over the past five years, we've been averaging just a little over 100,000. Okay. All right, so yeah. pretty steady. It's about, uh, about 7,000 plates. Yeah. Okay, all right. It's been pretty even. The plates have been been around that 7,000 number for a while now. Further questions? Well, what question? Yes, sir. Uh, did, can you tell me what the percentage of acceptance of grant applications are as compared to the total pool that applied? Is that curiosity? We had uh, 44 total apply and 23 are funded, so close to 50-50. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in past year, it's been upwards of close to like 90%. It depends on how many applications we get in any given year. And we have had some where they didn't make the cut one year and they come back and modify it and, and get approved the next year uh, after working with staff. Yes. Is there any consideration as this mini grant program continues to mature since it's, I mean, such a wonderful program in our region? For grant recipients, awardees that receive funding to to go into like a phase two where it's like a reduced number of grants but larger amount to further explore findings or outcomes of the mini grant, like as they if, when they finish the mini grant award through this, is there ever you know consideration to to scale it up or is that just largely just it's no? not an uncommon progression for particular successful mini grants to subsequently apply to the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund, which is a larger grant program. And so, uh, for example, the microplastics research that I was presenting on started off as a Bay mini grant and then was T-Burf. was awarded a couple of TBRF awards okay. after that. So thank you. A lot of it's smaller. You'll see a lot of elementary school, you know, gardens in the school. You'll see condominium complexes with water uh, um, improvements, you know, on that kind of thing. It hasn't been the big research type yes. thing typically, although there, you see some of that, but it's been, it's a way of the, um, getting some, a little bit of money out to the smaller organizations, but that's, it is something that we can always talk about. Absolutely. And I'm definitely interested in helping organizations that do want to level up, like mm-hmm. increasing their skills and capacity. So we've been talking internally about, um, grant writing workshops or, some way to, if they're interested, like optimal, of course, to help them learn how to do more of what they're interested in doing. So that those are all potentials too. And when did we set the five thousand dollar? <laughs> I don't think it's been adjusted for inflation for right. <laughs> there's there is a point of organizations, and that's where you know again that's a good discussion point for us. There are organizations that won't apply for a five thousand dollar grant because of the paperwork; it's just not worth five thousand dollars. Um, smaller ones, it's you know they want the five thousand dollars, so they're willing to put in the time. So that's certainly a discussion point for us. Yeah, we've point. we've done larger levels up to like ten thousand okay. dollars before as well. It's just balancing the the reserves we have and the projections of those license plate sales through the future, so that we're not bleeding through it on in a couple of years. And strategically, I think that we view the biggest value of the Bay Mini Grant Program. You know, we want it to produce good outcomes, but mostly we want people to be, become familiar with the estuary program, to feel a part of the restoration story. So there's utility to having, you know, more entities there. But that, again, that's exactly the kind of guidance and direction that we would look to this board, you know, to provide if we ought to think about that a little bit differently. Further questions at this point? I think you did a good job with some, and it looks like intentional diversity, which is part of one of the goals that's showing up there. So that's great. I just also want to say our Bay Mini Grant program has consistently been a wonderful way to diversify those that are receiving funds and participating in our program. Um, every year I put together an environmental justice report to submit to the to the US EPA and the majority of the projects you know that are making up that report have been coming from our Bay Mini Grants program overall and so EPA certainly recognized these community-based grant program as a way of getting those funds out there to the community more broadly. And on that there are organizations or individuals that you know of that might be interested in this kind of work. Um, at least a couple of these projects, I helped people build the scope of work from start to finish. So I'm happy to put that time in with people if if they're really interested in it. Thank you. Further questions or is there a motion to accept? We have a motion, we have a second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? So it passes unanimously. Item number nine. 
Marcus is actually on his way back from Portland, the scientific conference that we were at this past week. So I'll be presenting this item. All right. Um, this relates to the Bay Area Scientific Information Symposium uh, proceedings. We actually just published that in the Florida Academy of Sciences, uh, Florida Scientist publication. It was actually their largest volume ever. Um, and as such, uh, based on the, the initial contract we had with them, we actually went a little bit over in terms of total publication costs. And that was due to an increase in page count of including most of uh, the abstracts as well as papers that were submitted by the, the presenters from that conference, as well as a change in publisher that Florida Academies went through over this past year. So we originally had an agreement with them up to my uh, authority of $25,000. The total uh, publishing costs exceeded that amount by about $4,753. So we're just asking the board uh, to make that whole in terms of the, the total publication costs by entering into a new purchase order with the Florida Academy of Sciences for that remaining uh, publication cost that they incurred. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have on that. Uh, but like I said, I think we got a good product out of it. Uh, this is basically memorializing the science about every five to six years in the region. And this is the first time we actually got it into a peer reviewed uh, journal. So we think it's a good product. Very good. Questions, discussion, or motion? Motion to approve the expenditure of those second we have a motion second further discussion all in favor say aye aye any opposed show it passes unanimously item number 10. so this is the, the agenda item that we sent out earlier this week and it's based on uh, progression discussions that happened at the management board meeting if you recall and based on what my present in terms of some of our water quality priorities old tampa bay has been lagging behind in terms of maintaining uh water quality is supportive of uh, ongoing seagrass coverage. And this has been a high priority site for us. And as such, we've been building a lot uh, on a lot of the research and reasonable assurance documentation that we've been providing to the state to ensure that the work we're doing has an end goal of maintaining seagrasses in the whole Tampa Bay segment. Uh, this is some of the capacity assessment we actually put out on the streets earlier this summer, back in June. Uh, we had one respondent uh, apply during that first solicitation, it was Geosyntec. Uh, at that time, after review, uh, the boards agreed that we should place it back out on the streets to see if we could solicit more respondents. We did that over the past quarter through uh, about September through October. We um, re-advertised with specific points of trying to build upon both the, the traditional work we do, but thinking about more innovative ways to uh, get Old Tampa Bay back on track. And the RFP was basically set up around four main tasks of you know, exploring what new uh, paradigms might need to be developed that relate to both our long-term nutrient management controls as well as additional complementary actions that might have a benefit to getting that base segment back on track. Um, so those four tasks are basically creating a blueprint for that base segment as we move forward and how we interface with the Nitrogen Management Consortium who are the prime uh, uh, folks in charge uh, through permitted uh, discharges to uh, control nutrient uh, discharges to Old Tampa Bay. So that, again, this is what we are kind of considering our, our Nutrient Management 2.0. Uh, we've had a lot of success on the work we've done over the past 30 years working with the Nitrogen Management Con uh, Consortium to uh, get seagrasses back in uh, Tampa Bay, but Old Tampa Bay is a unique beast. Um, it, it's facing uh, not only nutrient issues, but also uh, uh, issues related to poor tidal circulation, and its its watershed is largely developed. So the opportunities to uh, niche research uh, restoration activities are limited. Uh, so we kind of have to think out of the box. And as such, you know that was sort of the intent of, of why we opened this RFP uh, to the consulting community. And as I mentioned, we had uh, a good response back. We got four respondents back toward, toward the second selection. Uh, we had five uh, review panel um, entities uh, go through those four contracts and look at seven specific criteria, four of which were based mostly on the technical merits of the projects. Uh, proposals that they submitted, and three were, were standard uh, criteria that we've used that rate whether or not they're considered a minority disadvantaged business enterprise that have the firm the action plan, where they've done work with us um, in the past over the past three years, 
and then just looking at the cost range of proposals we received. So they received a standard score from, from those three criteria, and then we relied on the review panel to provide us a technical merit score of those uh, four uh, additional criteria. So we had a, a, a really robust discussion when we assembled the review panel um, back earlier in November. Um, they actually provided scores based on uh, those those four technical merit criteria, as well as, uh, like I said, the, we provide the, the three um, uh, you know, uniform uh, criteria. So based on the technical criteria alone, you'll see in the updated agenda item, uh, there's a ranking associated with the scores based on that technical criteria. In the first column, there's the uniform assigned scores, and then there's an average total score. And there's a disparity between the, the technical rankings based solely on for the project proposal and scope versus looking at the total scoring across those seven criteria. We had additional discussion with the review panel uh, um, based on you know, what that, that meant in terms of uh, a final uh, respondent selection. And one of the things that was driving sort of looking at the total average scores was a, a cost uh, discrepancy of about $4,000 between the two top rank respondents. Uh, the review panel at that at, mm -hmm. at that point didn't think that that 4,000 differential uh, was should be the key driver in, in making a selection. Uh, and based on the technical merit scores alone, I made a recommendation to the management board to move forward with one respondent, Stantec, uh, who basically scored higher on, on the technical merits and approach that they um, provided uh, during this RFP process. We had a lengthy discussion at the management board meeting as well. And due to the closeness of the scoring and sort of that disparity between looking at just the technical merit criteria versus um, the totality of the total scoring, they felt it would be um, more prudent to ask both those top rank respondents to provide a presentation back to the review panel uh, and then provide uh, a new scoring based on those presentations and bring back a formal recommendation um, probably at the February board meeting. Um, so that's where it sort of stood based on the management board discussions, but I just wanted to reiterate sort of, we, this is sort of the several months now that we begin going through this process. I did provide a recommendation to the management board. Um, they, they provide an alternative recommendation to the policy board to hear the, the uh, top rank respondents uh, and give their pre presentations to the review panel again. We actually made that offer as well to the review panel um, uh, when we went through uh, uh, the initial uh, scoring and the review panel at that time, uh, mostly due to logistics and timing of these meetings, uh, you know, declined to have those presentations. So what we're planning for is probably to do that in the December timeframe. And again, trying to bring this back to you at the February board meeting. It's just another delay in sort of moving this work along. We know that old Tampa Bay is struggling. This is stuff that we wanted to get going for quite some time. Um, so I'm, I'm giving that totality of the discussions and where we're at on this topic of area. Uh, but as it stands right now, the, the management board recommendation was to uh, direct us as staff to invite the two top rank respondents, Stantec Consulting Services and Geocentex Consultants for a presentation and a subsequent evaluation considering the, the full criteria of the RFP and then bring that uh, a formal recommendation back to the February board meeting most likely. Be happy to answer any questions on that process. Like, like I said, uh, um, I think it was fairly close, uh, but my recommendation to the management board was based primarily on the, the novelty of the technical approach that Santec provided. And that was my recommendation to the management board. All right, thank you. Questions? So can we like override the management board's recommendation, just say, just go with Stantec? Or is it just, you know, we're gonna approve this recommendation to have the presentation? The final decision is made by this board. Uh, you can take into consideration, of course, the executive director's recommendation, the management board's recommendation, but ultimately you make the final decision. Right. Further questions? I also know that uh, both respondents are here today and, and they might want to say something as well. All right. Just want to get through if we have any questions for staff before we do that. Mm -hmm. All right. It feels like they had a really thorough process in this. 
you know, you all really took your time and you went back to the drawing board once and um, I'm inclined to, to go with Mr. Sherwood's recommendation myself. All right, before we get into the discussion or what I would maybe debate, do you have a question? I do have a clarifying question, if I may. Um, uh, Mr. Sherwood, could you clarify, could you repeat uniform, the uniform assigned scores without the SBE component? What was, what, was the, what was in the uniform assigned scores? So the three criteria were the based criteria. on whether uh, they were recognized as a disadvantaged woman-owned uh, business enterprise and have an affirmative action plan. The second uh, criteria that's uniformly scored is whether or not they've done work with the program over the past three years. Okay. And the last one was the cost differential between the proposals received. And really the driver um, difference between the sum of those three scores was the difference in, in the proposal costs, which equated to okay. $4,000. Were they weighted at all? Were those criteria weighted? Yes, so all seven of those criteria had specific uh, yeah, Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right, um, I'll, if each of the respondents will give you three minutes to step to the microphone and uh, offer your input for today. Uh, I'm Brandon Johnson with uh, Stantec. Um, just to follow up on the clarification of your question, uh, the, on, the, on the standardized scores, the, the scoring was identical except for the cost. So on WBE, SBE criteria and prior work, those were equal. It was, uh, the weighting of the scoring was. Uh, if, you, if you would step behind and use the mic, so the microphone so we can pick everything up. Absolutely. Uh, just saying that the score weighting uh, was the lowest score, and please add in my, correct me if I'm wrong, but. The lowest scoring proposal received the top points um, in that category and the highest was received the lowest points. So that $4,000 difference was uh, essentially a four point swing in that standard criteria um, versus two points for MBE and one point for, for the other. So, uh, and that's, that's in that shows in that table at eight to 12 there. Um, you know, I, uh, this is, you know, obviously not the forum. If we are going to have presentations, we'll get into the technical side. So I don't feel it's appropriate to review the proposals. Um, I can tell you, in, in an effort like this, you know, I think all the respondents recognize that this is a, a component of a larger picture of Old Tampa Bay, looking at the watershed as a whole. Uh, this is a uh, uh, the first cut at it, looking at the assimilative capacity, uh, and then exploring. Uh, opportunities elsewhere in the watershed we have that bigger picture in mind and with that said with all the scores that close in cost up to that cap it kind of reflects that um, you know, all the respondents I'm sure did some level of you know how much can we squeeze into the into this scope keeping in mind that there's a bigger picture um, you know to solve some of the problems with Old Tampa Bay so uh, that's where, you know, with the cost element there, I think I would assume there was a, a factor in each respondent trying to figure out what they could squeeze into that price, uh, knowing that there was a cap on the budget. So um, uh, that's really all I have to say, unless anybody has any specific questions for us. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Appreciate your time. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Scott Ditchie uh, with Geosyntec. Um, I've spoke to you guys previously when we were the uh, sole respondent the first time this came out. So, you know, we went back, we prepared, we spent additional time, effort, and money and prepared a, a, a second proposal. It should be noted that for all three scoring iterations at the November 3rd Selection Committee, Geosyntec was the number one ranked firm. Obviously, there was uh, some discussion outside the selection committee to, to go with the number two firm. So I took the opportunity last Friday to speak to the management board. I want to draw everyone's attention to the difference in the scores on the technical. There seems to be this um, 
thread of this being an overwhelming consensus that one firm was better, but we're talking about less than two points, less than two point difference. We're essentially tied. So instead of coming up and asking to be awarded to us, Geosyntec made the recommendation initially at the management board to oral presentations, which is common practice with these kind of solicitations. Afterwards, uh, I think it should be noted that Kelly Levy, Rajesh, uh, and a number of the management board agreed with that approach. There was some concerns raised about the procurement process itself and, and kind of not following exactly what was in the RFQ. And I'd like you to consider the management board's recommendations. We have two firms that are pretty much on equal footing. Uh, this is an incredibly important project, and we'd like to further clarify and explain our approach to the selection board so we can better you know, what I think will be the best path forward for Old Tampa Bay, whatever that may be. So thank you for your time. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just want to add, so the, the five review committee members represented both the nitrogen management consortium co-chairs, both on the industry and government side, as well as the Department of Environmental Protection, the Southwest Florida Water Management District, and, and our staff. So the, those those five groups were represented on the review com committee. When we went through the technical scoring process, five of those five entities scored the geocentric uh, proposal S2. As, as the second rank respondent. Four of the five of those review committee members scored the score Stantec as the, the first rank respondent. So that is a lot of the basis and consideration I put into my recommendation to the management board. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the cost differential of $4,000 was not seen to be a significant driver in, in, in conducting this necessary work in Old Tampa Bay. and. and the review committee felt that they did not want to put that as the sole bearing of making a respondent selection. So that is the totality of the discussion that I take into consideration as I made a recommendation to the management board. And I agree that you know there's some uh, consideration by the management board members on uh, looking at just the technical scoring merit alone versus the entire range of those seven criteria. Uh, I provided the, a recommendation to the management board based on what I think the science needs to evolve to in Old Tampa Bay. And, and that was the basis of my recommendation. So I just wanted to sort of clarify that in terms of, of, of um, differentials and in, in, in just looking at the technical merit score versus the total, the total scoring of the criteria. Further questions? Hey, could I add some? Yes, sir, absolutely. <clears throat> During the uh, management board meeting um, last week, uh, I learned that the um, staff during the evaluation committee process felt that presentations would be helpful um, and, and recommended to the evaluation committee that presentations be held. The evaluation committee chose not to do that for whatever reason. They weren't required to do that, but they chose not to do it despite uh, the recommendation of staff. The RFP makes it clear that presentations can be held. Uh, so if this board decides to approve the management board recommendation to hold presentations, that is consistent with the RFP because there is language that anticipates that presentations would be held. Uh, but I just wanted you to be aware of that background and the language in the RFP. And you want to answer the second question that's coming okay. about the policy board's authority in this matter? Well, you, you the, absolutely. The policy board has the authority to make, the, as I said earlier, to make the final decision. You can take into account um, what the management board did. You can take into account what the executive director's recommendation is. Very good. Further questions or discussion? Yes, sir. Yeah, this is the point of a clarification here. You're not asking us today to to serve you know, the management board and make a decision today, is my understanding. We, we certainly just to advance to. We, no, we can certainly do. We, we can do whatever. On our own. You want to do today? Motion. We, I'm asking what we, Mr. Sherwood. Is. 
Well, his original recommendation was to go with Stantec. I know, I know. But the today management he's, board, he's, he's recommending to, to, to have a presentation side of that, correct? Well, I think he's bringing forth the management board's recommendations, yeah. not necessarily his recommendation. Okay, are you, are you consistent with their recommendation or are you adverse to their recommendation? No. If this, that's the direction of the board. We will hold presentations and move on from there. It's now in our court. Oh, I, I understand. I was just asking <laughs> his, his, his professional opinion, you know, that in all deference to the management board, should, should be that those, those presentations occur. Certainly. So that's a yes. Yes. In deference to the management board. Yes. That's if you want to be in deference to them. Further discussion or, or conversation on this? So essentially, it's a delay in, you know, a few months, an additional delay in a few months. Yeah, it's it's really, I mean, yeah, it is a delay. Um, it is a it is a big deal. Um, it is not the delay is not the end of the world as far as the the completion of it. Um, it is where your comfort level is of making the decision on right. on the. Evaluation committee's thoughts on the management board's thoughts on our professional staff's thoughts. Um, this is this is one of those decision points. This is why we make the big bucks. <laughs> you have been getting the extra stipend for being on the board, right? <laughs> Further conversation, or is someone ready to make a motion? I would move to. Um follow the recommendation with Stantec at this point and not delay in it any further. There's a motion, is there a second? I'll second that. All right, further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. All right, let's, I heard uh, one opposed. Everyone else was in favor? Is that accurate? Whoever's counting votes, you got that? I got it. So the motion passes. The staff will be directed to carry that out. Thank you very much. Item number 11, Executive Director of Staff Report. Mr. Sherwood. But first and foremost, I wanted to welcome Jill Kanish to our, our staff. She just started with the program uh, in the beginning of November. She's going to be helping out uh, in terms of our internal accounting and directly working and interfacing with our external accountant. Uh, so please help me welcome her board. She's, she's not new to the area. She worked with Tampa Bay Watch previously, so uh, she knows and is familiar with a lot of the environmental work being conducted in the Bay. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, second item I just wanted to bring the board's attention to is uh, we did complete our program evaluation uh, uh, through EPA. This is required of us every five years uh, to ensure that we're implementing the CCMP at appropriate pace. So I just wanted to bring to the board's attention, they provided a letter back to us uh, over the interim period that basically said we're uh, achieving very proficient uh, status in terms of implementing our CCMP and gave us nothing but kudos. I know Tom McGill uh, provided some comments back at the August board meeting uh, to that effect, but we actually received uh, that uh, official letter from EPA uh, in September. And then last but not least, I just wanted to uh, mention that we did submit our bipartisan infrastructure law third year funding proposal. Uh, there was four Tidal Creek projects as well as a Living Shoreline uh, project identified in McKay Bay that we're moving forward with. Uh, I just wanted to bring that to the board's attention. We're still waiting to receive word that that agreement has uh, been approved by EPA, but we're expecting that third year funding to come down and help support those, those programs. Um, the last thing I just wanted to mention, uh, I, Kind of alluded to it uh, over the past week, uh, both Marcus Beck and I, and I were at the Coastal and Environmental, uh, sorry, Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation meeting um, in Portland, Oregon. This is basically a biannual meeting that happens about every 
uh, two years, usually rotating from the east and west coast, but it brings together international science to talk about uh, the science that we're all conducting in these special places along the coast. Uh, Mark's presented on our habitat master plan update and some of the open science frameworks that were developed to uh, identify new uh, habitat restoration targets and goals. And I present on some of our, our new underserved equity strategies that um, I will lead to as well. Also during that week, we had an Association of National Electric Programs meeting um, out in uh, Portland uh, at the Lower Columbia River Estuary Partnership uh, uh, offices. It was held in, in combination with their program in Tillamook Bay. And again, that was an opportunity for us to come together as the National Estuary Programs and talk about the, the, the science that we're conducting. Uh, in our respective regions. So he's on his way back. Um, uh, as, 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 as we're talking, I think he's on his way back today. Um, wanted to turn it over to a staff update. Uh, Jessica, if you want to go first, talk a little bit about the, the deeper priorities moving into this year. Sure. Um, the, as a reminder, TBRF is the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund. It's a grant program that we administer with Restore America's Estuaries. The RFP will come out mid-January and will likely close in mid-March. I haven't selected those exact dates yet, but just a heads up. We do choose priorities each year to either address things like uh, habitat um, acreage that we think met quite fast, as fast as we would like to see it met, uh, or other issues that we'd like to prioritize to bring attention to. So those in front of you are the recommended priorities this year. <clears throat> Um, if some of them address like some of those habitat targets that I just mentioned for the Habitat Master Plan 2030 targets, um, and some others were chosen to take advantage of funding that might is anticipated in the coming years, like moisture uh, restoration, for example. Also, nutrient loading, nutrient load reduction, green infrastructure, and septic conversion continue to be top priorities for water quality improvement. Um, as is science literacy throughout the watershed. To the point of the conversation earlier, I think um, turf could fall under the green infrastructure best management practices. So certainly would welcome any um, proposals regarding that. And this is not an action item, but if you have feedback or would like to discuss any of those, I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. I think we heard that potential projects looking at artificial turf uh, would be appropriate for this call as well. Thank you. You want to talk a little bit about the additional Bay Mini Grant fund use? Sure. License plate fund use. So we kind of, we sort of got to this a little bit earlier. Uh, TARP and TAG revenue funds the Bay Mini Grant program currently. That is the only thing that the TARP and TAG funds are used for. We're interested in exploring the use of that revenue for additional programming. Possibilities include using the funds to support urban and suburban backyard habitat creation, potentially on private properties in some circumstances, or reduction of nutrient loading from stormwater runoff, particularly from irrigation and erosion. Um, there are a lot of options that we can look at. We're mostly at this point interested in garnering feedback from you all on your openness to using TARP and TAG revenue for something other than Bay Mini Grant, uh, potentially. Um, but of course, would also still be implementing the CCMP. And if those options may include property that's not public or not on a conservation easement, if you're interested or open to that as well, uh, to take advantage of additional restoration and water quality improvement opportunities. What, on a private property, what would be an example? <laughs> So the, the thing that sort of brought this about is Pinellas County's FLIP program. That's the Florida Friendly Landscape Incentive Program, where um, the, the county received DEP funding to implement this program. Homeowners can receive up to $2,000 in rebate for removing irrigation and putting in either no irrigation or drip irrigation, which is much more efficient, and um, installing Florida-friendly native landscape or not native Florida friendly landscaping in on their private property. So that is that program will expire next September through Pinellas County. 
I don't think it would look exactly like that. I, I don't think we're necessarily going to like replicate that exactly, but that is an example of something that could be a potential program. Questions? So we would we still be able to um, fund the mini grants? Sure. I think the intent would be to use some of the uh, extra funds that we have built up over time. And um, maybe Ed can answer this better, but not taking away from the funds that come in annually, but using some of the funds that we have in savings from TARP and TAG revenue. Yeah, it would be an alternative use of those additional funds that we have, and, and Don's provided some guidance on based, based on what the state uh, legislature language says for the use of those specialty license point funds to implement the CCMP. So we'd come back to you all with a recommendation of how to use those alternative funds. It'd be interesting to know uh, how, how, what the success of the, the FLIP program was, how many how many house homes uh, were able to be done and to, be, to have some background information on how successful that program was. I have a little bit of information. I've talked to Stacey Day and Christine Joyner. Um, it started right before the pandemic, so it was a difficult thing to implement. I think they, it seems like they haven't quite gotten through that upswing and staff changes have made it difficult. So um, it hasn't been as successful as they would like it to, but they are, and they do anticipate using all the funds that they were given for it before it expires. So I would consider that a success. I don't know, every year we bring a, um, a resident in and we recognize them with this beautiful uh, plaque for their water conservation and Florida friendly landscaping, all of that. Um, but I hadn't heard the name flip in there. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I, I don't know. I think it's fine to have more flexibility with funds and how you want to use them. I just, I don't, you know, we just went through the mini grants and you had 200,000 apply and only, you know, able to give out 100,000 or so. So, um, you know, whatever that pool of accrued tarp and tag money is, if you want to use it for, I don't have a How much was the original flip grant? Like the total? Yeah. I don't remember, but I can, I can get that for you. So I, I think that is important too. I mean, there's only $300,000 and we're looking at $2,000 per that money will go pretty fast. So I, I, I don't know. It's a little. Yeah, we, we'd want to be intentional about what we're proposing yeah. um, for those funds, and it'd be probably time limited so that we we do have, hold a certain reserve in place too. Yes. And, and right now we're not proposing an alternative. We're just assessing sure. your openness to us developing an alternative in addition to Bay Mini Grants, which is going to be core to continue to core it, Certainly, yeah, you could, I mean, you could really get, uh, no pun, but deep into the weeds on um, on where you want to go with this. I, I mean, I'm okay with some flexibility and, and certainly on the reserves. I, the second part of the conversation is I think that um, we should talk about maybe upping, you know, from five to 7,500 or 10 on these grants. Um, and then we could talk about geography, about whether we want to target how we want to target whether it's just some how, random house that someone applies or is it do we want to target geographically in watersheds or in uh, creek systems that have been part of our work plan um you know or low income areas or you know how you know any of those any of those factors could be part of this whole discussion and then also some set aside money for um at least digital advertising to make people aware of this program there are limitations on what percentage of the specialty uh, license plate that we can use on advertising. And so um, we either need to stay within those limits or we fund those from alternatives right. so that everyone's well, we just We don't want it to be just like, you know. Same people that already know the choir. Yeah, right. sure. that does That kind of defeats what we were talking about earlier about making an awareness as part of the mission. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, you know, I think it might be interesting to, I mean, as you're talking about increasing, maybe have a percentage, so maybe up it to 150 next year, 150,000, and there will be a certain number of grants within that 10 to 7,500, and then some of the 
you know, the rest for the lower because I don't want to have some of the better well-known, I mean, there's a lot of UF IFAS stuff on there, which I'm sure is great, but they know about these. And so the, the smaller organizations may feel, well, now that this is a much bigger grant, we don't have an opportunity. So I still like having that lower threshold for say your neighborhood group projects and then maybe just an upper tier for um, bigger projects. It's not saying that those neighborhood projects might not win, but sure. just um, right. not, yeah, mm -hmm. keeping the barrier for entry pretty low. Um, yeah, no one, it, there were only a couple of it actually went to 5,000, although they were really close. I thought that was kind of clever. <laughs> I really like that tiered uh, approach. I, I would encourage consideration of exploring that. And I think if we were to, to keep that barrier low, um, perhaps in that higher barrier, that 7,500 or so, that's reflective of, of inflation, perhaps that could include some of that grant writing or technical capacity building, if that's something that would fall within the mini grants, that there could be that right capacity building for those frequent flyers of the mini grant to also go for larger grants outside of the TBRF potentially. Too. So I really like that and would encourage that. So I think you're hearing there's there's an openness to the dialogue and flexibility. Yes. Thank you. But keeping the small and uh, exploring. Yeah, we're not, gonna, we're not going to we're not move away from that core part of the philosophy. So whatever we propose would be in addition to. Very good. Okay. Uh, we had one more staff update. You really have a presentation on the debris derby. Yeah, it's just it's just a one pager. So um, on November fourth, um, we partnered with Powerpole and Skinny Water Culture, which are two private companies, as well as uh, Tampa Bay Waterkeeper um, and Ocean Aid three hundred and sixty to host the hopefully first annual uh, Tampa Bay Debris <laughs> Derby. So as a reminder, this is a, a was a trash collection tournament um, and it was very successful. So we had 40 teams participate. Um, so that equated to about over 140 people actually participating in the event. Um, so teams signed up to clean up <laughs> trash um, on boats, paddle boards, kayaks, um, as well as on land, like at the park or in mangroves. Um, and so people were allowed to pick up trash from around the watershed. And when we when we were talking to people, they, they said they, they and their teams had been out scouting for the last couple of weeks, trying to find <laughs> good locations or hot spots of, of some big trash. Um, so we did, um, we set it up as more of like a, a raffle based prize. Um, prize options so that folks who just had a team of one or two people would still have a similar opportunity to win <laughs> different prizes. Um, so for every bag of trash that you brought in or large item like a tire or um, an anchor, those would all equal one raffle prize. And then we had a special prize available for the team that brought in the greatest amount of weight of trash as well as the strangest item. So um, we had over uh, 4,600 pounds of trash collected by the different the different teams. Um, so we actually filled up a 30 yard dumpster, which is one of the largest dumpsters that you can order. Um, and we had a whole variety of items collected. We had like a giant buoy that had probably broken off during the hurricane. Um, we had shopping carts and um, cabinets and bikes. And so, so it was a real diversity of, of uh, trash that was collected. Um, and then we had about 30 um, industry partners donate prizes for the, the raffle event. Um, and we had coolers, we had a power pole, um, sports tickets, as well as like angling guides. Um, so it was, it was a really fun, really fun event. Um, and it was really set up like a, um, an inshore fishing tournament. So if you've ever been to one of those. So um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we think that it was a, a really great success. Um, and I think part of that success was because we partnered with some private companies. Um, so 
through their networks, we were able to reach a, a broader audience than the estuary program we usually reach. Um, so we loved it. The people that I talked to that participated also had said that they had a really good time um, and we're looking forward to doing a similar event next year. How many hours were you out pumping? What's up guys, it's Justin Tramble. They had about four, four hours to go out, yeah. So uh, Kyle Boatworks, um, produced this recap video for us. Um, the 2.3 tons in four hours. Tampa Bay Waterkeeper, and welcome to the first ever Tampa Bay Debris Derby. Um, hopefully this is the start of something that we do annually. We've got a lot of uh, industry folks, a lot of um, just the community excited to be Justin. Play it. We can share it. What's up guys, it's Justin Tramble with Tampa Bay Waterkeeper. <laughs> so that's the way in. So after folks came back, they weighed in all their trash um, and then they went and we had food available for them. And as you can see, like a couple of the, the um, folks that donated raffles actually set up like um, uh, tables and a couple of people. And had welcome their boats to there. the so, first ever um, Tampa Bay Cornhole, Debris so Derby. Was, um, was, hopefully, this is the start of something that we do <laughs> annually. We've got a lot of uh, industry folks, a lot of um, just the community excited to be here today and participating, picking up trash all over the Tampa Bay estuary and bringing it here to E.G. Simmons Park. Um, it's just really exciting to see it all come together and people getting really pumped up yeah, was, to pick up was, some trash. It was pretty windy. Um, it was gusting about 30 miles an hour, um, but people still got out, hit the water, and There wasn't, and we had a, a meeting, um, and like a lesson learned, and that's one of the things that we think we could do a better job at next year. Um, we also want to make a more directed effort at partnering with kayak outfitters as well as um, Freedom Boat Club to get um, access to boats and kayaks for folks that might not have those items on their own. On behalf of the Tampa Bay Debris Derby event committee, thank you for everybody that showed up today to clean up the bay. We collected over what two tons plus. Yeah. So thank you guys very much. We'll see you next year. Protect their boats so that they don't get their boats all banged up. And then a lot of the fishermen are using like their grapple hooks and, and that kind of stuff to really pull pull stuff in. So. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Thank you. Awesome. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. The, the so only... next year you're going to be playing into up your game, right? That's the plan. We'd like to double it in size. I heard that I heard that we're going to have a competition between Pasco County and That's what I'm doing. Around State Road 39. <laughs> 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 Around State Road 39. The only other thing I wanted to bring to the board's attention is a bit of somber news. We we got some uh, sad news this week that Bob McConnell, who's was a longstanding management board member from Tampa Bay Water. He actually passed away earlier this week. Um, so please send your condolences uh, to Tampa Bay Water and their staff, because I know they're, they, they caught them up by guard as well, off guard as well. Thank you for sharing. Um, anything on the information packets? There's the TAC report and the Community Advisory Committee report and a summary of our um, social media and outreach statistics that are available for you to review. There's also a hyperlink to the Smart Sheets if you want to delve in deeper. I'm happy to do that with you. The next meeting is uh, scheduled to meet here on uh, February 16th. And so hope you have happy holidays between here and then. Anything else for the good of the order? Yes, ma'am. Um, I mentioned this to Ed, and I just wanted to say it quickly to staff. Uh, he said that Maya was the one who does it, a lot of it, but I really love your agendas and how clear and short they are and how they have links to the things we actually need to look at. So uh, as someone who looks at a lot of agendas, it's 
best agenda I get. So I just wanted to make sure I said that publicly and how much I appreciate it and how good you all are at linking. It's, just, it's apparently a very special skill. <laughs> I would second that too, and the boards that I serve on yours is the best, as far as that organization expectations and timeliness, way ahead of time, all that stuff, debriefing, offering, all that stuff makes a difference. And Charlie wants a great move. It does. It's a team effort. It is a team effort. Anything else? All right. Happy holidays, everyone. We'll see you in February. Gosh, happy new year. I'm going to give you all a lot more work. Let's see.